The COVID-19 Military Support Initiative was launched by the Association of Defense Communities, Blue Star Families, and participants of the White Oak Collaborative. It's a comprehensive resource for communities, states, and military families during this pandemic, with virtual events, daily news updates, and ongoing pain points polling. The Association of Defense Communities is a leader in supporting the resilience of communities and states that support America's military. Blue Star Families is a national nonprofit supporting active duty, National Guard, Reserve, veterans, and their families while strengthening local communities. The initiative is presented by Booz Allen Hamilton with significant support from USAA. Other sponsors include the Bristol Myers Squibb Foundation, the Association of Military Banks of America, the Military Housing Association, Hunt Companies, JP Morgan Chase and Company, and First Command Financial. And now, today's CMSI virtual event. Live virtual event. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today at, for the COVID-19 Military Support Initiative Town Hall. I am especially excited today to be able to welcome General John Hyten, the um, Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the husband of Laura Hyten, who has been a wonderful partner for us and a contributor to our CMSI initiative. General Hyten uh, attended Harvard University, was commissioned in the Air Force, and is an expert in space. Before taking his role as Vice Chairman, General Hyten was Commander of Strategic Command. We've been so fortunate to have his support as well as his wife's. Throughout his leadership roles, he has understood that people are a priority and they need to be taken care of, and that is certainly our theme here. I will keep my introduction brief so we can hear from the General. General Hyten, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, uh, thanks very much, Kathy. Uh, it is. It's fun to be here. Laura has talked to me a, a lot about uh, this as we've uh, gone through the last few weeks, months of COVID-19. And so uh, Kathy reached out to me, Laura uh, encouraged me, and I'm, I'm glad to be here. I just wish I could spend the entire time with the town hall, but I only have a few minutes at the beginning to just walk through and uh, share some uh, thoughts with you. Um, let me make sure that uh, you guys can hear me. Uh, Kathy, can you confirm that? Uh, uh, we hear you and we see you. You look great. All right. Well, that's that's not true, but uh, I appreciate the comment anyway. Uh, so first of all, uh, uh, let me just say on behalf of the chairman, General Milley, and the SEAC, uh, uh, Chief Colon Lopez, and, and me and our families, thanks to each and every one of you for what you do every day uh, to take care of your families, our military families, and, and our nation as a whole, because that's what you do. Uh, and, and we appreciate it a lot. Uh, so what I was asked to talk about is I was tasked, asked to talk about uh, kind of the new normal. How do we adjust to this new world that we're living in? And how does the military adjust to the new normal that we have to get to? So that, that's what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, but as I, as I talk about it, it's, it's kind of an interesting th thing to me because I know what we mean when we say the new normal. How do we adjust to this new normal? Uh, but it's it's an interesting dynamic because I, I actually don't like that that term that much. And the reason I don't like it is it because it gives me, you know, flashbacks to so many new normals that I've been through in my, you know, 39 years in the military. Uh, Laura and I have been through many, many changes together. And I it's it's it, we like to look back, uh, but we are challenged to look forward. And so I, I just want to go back and and get you to think about a few things as we start down this path and and you know people say gosh i wish we could go back to the way it was and so i think about that and i think about the way life was when we lived here on september the 11th 2001 uh, i was stationed in the pentagon uh that day uh and the world changed and so you you go back and you say god i wish we could live when it was september the 10th again when we didn't have tsa when you could just walk out to the airport and walk through to the gate and 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 see your loved ones and and get in an airplane without having to go through uh, all this extra security don't you wish you could go back and and then you wish you could go back before uh august the uh, 2nd of 
of 1990 when Iraq invaded Kuwait and we didn't have to worry about those kind of pieces and we were not really involved in the Middle East and we've been in the Middle East ever since that time. If you're in the Air Force, you've been doing combat operations since then. We've been at war in the Middle East since 2001. It's it's amazing how it go back before that it was the Cold War, before that it was Vietnam, before that it was Korea, before that was World War II. And, and every time a crisis has happened in this country, we always say, gosh, I wish we could go back to the way it was. But that's not our, our job. Our job is to figure out how to go back to the way that is. And the challenge we have right now is COVID-19. And how do we move forward into a world that is COVID-19? Now, you should know that uh, with the Deputy Secretary of Defense, I chair the DOD task force. I've been involved in the White House task force really since the very early stages. And, and right now, you should be very confident that there is a vaccine somewhere out there in the future. That vaccine could be there this year. I mean, it, it, is, it is that close. We're spending huge resources in the talent of this country and the talent of our allies and partners to try to figure out how to get a vaccine. But we really have to think about how do we as a nation and then we as a military operate in the COVID world. And so when it first happens, you kind of take a step back. It's just like we did on 9-11. I remember showing up in the Pentagon, going to work on the 12th of September that day, knowing we were going to war, war uh, and having a pretty good idea where we we're gonna go to war. Um, but, but we took a step back for a little while, figured out exactly where things were, put things in place and then move forward. That's what we did when COVID hit us too. We took a step back, we took uh, a look at things, we pushed things out to a combatant commander, Northern command, and now we're starting to adjust. But as we go through that, we have to take care of our families too. We have to take care of our fellow citizens. We have to do that. That's exactly what we've been doing. So the first question a lot of people ask me from a military perspective is, are we ready today to handle whatever threats uh, that, that we have to deal with? And the answer is by every measure you can have is that we are ready for every threat that potentially we would face today in the world. And so if you think about the numbers, the numbers are pretty interesting uh, because as of this morning, and I look at the numbers every day, uh, in the active duty force, we've had 5,888 uh, active duty service men and women who have been infected with COVID-19, 5,888. That's of the just over 1.3 million service men and women we have. So that's, you know, that is less than one half of 1% of our population are impacted. And of that one half of 1%, less than 2% actually have to be hospitalized. And tragically, uh, we've lost two active duty members and we mourn those, we've lost dependents, we've lost others. But in the overall scheme, when you watch what happens in the rest of the country, the impacts on our military service are not nearly as significant as they are in the rest of the country. What and why is that? Uh, it's, it's that way for a fairly simple reason is that our force is on a whole, young, fit, healthy. And because of that, we fight through all diseases much better than the rest of the country and the rest of the world. So the one thing I would like to make sure we, we take out of this is the need to continue to focus on fitness and a healthy lifestyle, not just for our, our members, but for our families as well. Because if you're healthy and you're fit and, and you do happen uh, to, uh, get hit with the COVID virus or whatever other virus happens to be out there, uh, you have a pretty good chance of, of fighting through it and, and being just fine. Most of the 5,888 that we've had have experienced very, very mild symptoms. Uh, some have experienced no symptoms and we fight through those. But then we have to figure out how to operate together and effectively uh, work and do our missions. And so we've done things. We've done uh, restrictions of movement that impact our families and impact our members as well. And when we set aside uh, operators like uh, in our nuclear submarines or going out in the next carrier, we separate uh, folks from the world for a couple of weeks before they actually uh, go out on mission. That way we make sure that they, they don't experience the virus. That's a significant impact because that's two weeks on the front end of a deployment that we weren't having to deal with before, two weeks on the back end, that's an extra month away from families. That's a significant impact we have to walk through. We have to figure out how to work through all those things. And then we have to stay 
uh, keep a close eye on it. Uh, because as we adjust our training and adjust our lifestyles and adjust our structure, we actually don't know what the future's uh, going to bring, not all the way across the board. So we have to figure out how to train in different ways, how to operate in different ways, uh, how to be safe, because we don't know that COVID-19 is going to go beyond 2020. We'd like to think there's going to be a, a vaccine out there, but um, in 2021 or 2022 or 2023, there could be another COVID virus or there could be another SARS or there could be another virus. And, and when that pandemic happens and in today's day and age, when we're so intertwined across the globe, it'll happen again, whether it's COVID-19 or something else. And we need to be able to respond better and learn from what we've done this time and be able to respond and go through it. We have to figure out how to work with our allies and partners and deal with this in a way that we can train together and continue to move forward. Uh, but the one challenge uh, I'd like to <clears throat> emphasize is that in the overall scheme, this is just a traumatic event like 9-11 was. This is a traumatic event like the uh, invasion of Kuwait and, and us going into uh, uh, Desert Storm and Desert Shield. This is like the Cold War, this is like Vietnam, like Korea. It's, it's another challenge that is put in front of us and our job is to figure out how to go through it. And then the last thing I wanna talk about is really the families because we're gonna figure out as a military how to go through this. Uh, we have to make sure we bring our families with us. And there's a lot of things that we can do. We, we need to do some smart things in terms of moving into the 21st century with our families. Um, we have opportunities. We can, we can actually use this, this pandemic, this crisis as an example of how we have to move and do business different ways. Uh, the way we do household goods shipments, uh, that's a 20th century model. Our personnel system is a 20th century model. Uh, the way we look at our, our healthcare in many ways is a 20th century model. We have not moved forward into the 21st century. Uh, the way we manage our entire family structure is still an old way of doing business. Uh, we have to step forward and do that. We need to do that on the military side. We need to do that on the family side. If we do that, we have a huge opportunity um, to actually make things better for all of us as we come out the other side of whatever the future looks like. Uh, if you want to call it the new normal, uh, we can call it the new normal. Uh, but I'd just like to say it's normal. Uh, we just have another challenge that's put in front of us. And just like we did when we faced the challenge with terrorism, just like we did when we faced the challenge with communism, we will figure out how to deal with this challenge and continue to operate and live in just an amazing country with amazing people. And we'll figure out how to work together again. Um, we always have and we always will. So I just wanna thank uh, Laura for encouraging me to do this, for Kathy for allowing me the time. Uh, and I, I know you have a great panel set up uh, of people that really understand this issue from a military side as well as a family side. And I, I look forward to your future discussion and, and getting your feedback. So now I have to run to my next meeting, but from the Pentagon, uh, thanks each and every one of you once again, uh, for all that you do for all of us. Thanks very much, Kathy. Thank you so much, General. Those were fantastic words, inspiring. And um, you have a large cross-sector group of nonprofits and philanthropies and uh, companies that are ready to stand <laughs> next to you to move towards that modernization. We appreciate your leadership. All and right, a big thanks. shout out to Laura too. You bet, you. Enjoy, the, enjoy the town hall. Thank you. I'm going to uh, toss things over to uh, my buddy, Matt, now. Matt, if I can ask you to join us and uh, welcome everyone to join the next half of our discussion. Matt? Thanks, Kathy. I appreciate that. I apologize for not being able to do the webcam today. Uh, we just have the one office here at the house, and my wife outranked me today and said uh, she gets it this afternoon. So I am coming live to you from my basement. Uh, that was a, a great uh, introduction to this topic, and, and the general, General Heighton really helped set the stage for today's discussion. Um, but before we get into the panel, 
we know many of you are going to have questions around this topic. Uh, if you have a question, please submit it through the chat page on the forum. Our participants will do their best to field as many as possible, uh, but please be patient uh, if we can't get to yours. Now, to dive further into this issue, we've assembled a diverse panel to hear from, uh, representing multiple uh, perspectives, um, how the military and our national security will adapt to a, a new normal uh, being imposed by COVID-19. I'll first introduce our panelists and then we'll dive straight into the questions. First, we have Lieutenant General David Barno, U.S. Army retired. General Barno is currently the visiting professor of strategic studies at John Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies and a contributing editor to War on the Rocks. We also have Brigadier General Brett Sylvia, Deputy Commander of the U.S. Army 1st Cav Division, uh, who is currently coming to us live from uh, his training exercise in Poland. Next, we have Dr. Nora Beneschel, who is also a visiting professor of strategic studies at the John Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies and a contributing editor to War on the Rocks. And then finally, we have Andy Napoli, Director of Installation Analysis at the Office of the Assistant Secretary of the Army for Installations, Energy, and Environment. Welcome all. So let's let's dive in. And General uh, General Barno and, uh, and Dr. Dr. Beneschel, I'm hoping you can help us really kind of set the stage. Um, how is COVID-19 impacting our national defense strategy right now? Uh, we, we heard from General Hyten, uh, but I'd like to get your thoughts. And then also, what are the implications for the role the military plays in our national security moving forward? Uh, Dr. Beneschel, do you want to want to kick us off? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, there, the pandemic is really going to have two tremendous impacts on the U.S. military, um, and, and I'll talk a little bit about them in general, and then uh, my colleague, General Barno, with whom I've written on this subject, will we'll talk a little bit more about some of the specific details. The first big change is that the way that most Americans conceptualize national security is about to change, and in fact has already changed very dramatically. For many years, the biggest threats to the nation were seen as coming from potential external threats, and that's what the entire Department of Defense is oriented towards. But the pandemic has revealed that threats within the homeland can be equally deadly, and in some cases, far more deadly. The number of Americans who have died from during this pandemic is already at 71,000. That's uh, more than 20% greater than the number of people killed in Vietnam, for example. And the final death toll in the United States could go as high as 200,000. So people are really feeling that personal security from threats inside the homeland uh, are more important to their day-to-day -day lives than potential threats from places like China and Russia and other places that are far away. DOD has only played a very limited role in the response to the pandemic, and that's by design. It's designed to focus on potential external threats. Uh, but that means that a lot of Americans are going to see the Department of Defense as nowhere near as relevant to their own new definitions of personal security going forward. And that's going to be a big transformative change throughout American society. The second big change follows from that, and that's that the defense budget is almost certainly going to go down, and it is probably going to go down a lot uh, in, to levels that make uh, sequestration era cuts look small by comparison. Part of that is there's going to be political pressure from Americans to do more to prepare for future pandemics, to uh, strengthen resiliency in the health system, in our nation more broadly. Um, part of that is that as they prioritize internal security more than external security, they will uh, you know, want resources to be shifted away from the agency that consumes uh, half of the discretionary budget and 15% of the overall uh, United States government budget. But finally, the economic crisis that the pandemic has brought uh, on the United States will also cause a great deal of uh, budgetary constraints overall. Uh, the United States government has already borrowed almost $4 trillion this year that will go straight into the national debt in order to deal with pandemic relief. And I don't think that the United States uh, government has done uh, spending money on that yet. So combined with how Americans are going to see their own security differently, plus some enormous economic constraints 
uh, from that will be exacerbated by the need to rebuild, I think that the defense budget is going to shrink uh, pretty substantially in the years to come. And I think I would add some detail to that and build on those ideas as well as we look kind of inside the, uh, the DOD and understand what kind of impact this is going to have on the military itself. And I, I don't think you can overestimate the impact that this particular crisis is having on the country. And I might take issue a little bit with General Heighton's view that uh, we've gone through these before. This is a crisis and this is a disruptive event of the size and scope that hasn't happened in my lifetime, in, in my judgment. And I think the closest approximation to it is probably, you know, the combination of the, the Great Depression in terms of the economic impacts and cost and disruption and elements of World War II, although thankfully the casualties have not risen to that level uh, at this point in time around the world or in the United States. But it's going to have a significant effect going forward on the U.S. military, if in no other reason than the defense budget is going to face some severe pressure in the face of those huge deficits that the United States is going to run this year, next year, and, and into the future, uh, and the impact that's going to have on uh, overall federal revenues and where the United States is going to spend the remaining dollars it spends. That four trillion dollars is not going at all to the Defense Department, except in perhaps in very, very marginal areas. It's going to go to rebuilding parts of the country and buttressing the nation against the shocks of this pandemic. Uh, and that's quite striking in and of itself. But as you heard uh, Dr. Bensahel talking about, the, the military and its role in this is relatively modest compared to any other crisis, particularly the ones that General Hyten walked through here over the, the last 20 minutes. The U.S. military had a central role in every single one of those changing events that he described. The U.S. military has a marginal role, frankly, and, and probably should have a marginal role in responding to this crisis, both the economic side and the military side, and the, and which is very, very small. So economically, not the role of the military, and from a medical standpoint, not really the role of the military to, to play a key role in this crisis. So what's that mean inside of DOD going forward? Um, we've written about this uh, a number of times in our column at War on the Rocks now, but we see a couple of big trends that are likely to come out of this for the Pentagon. Uh, first, we think that the domains of space and cyber are going to have much higher priorities in future Pentagon thinking and in Pentagon defense spending and that the domains of air, land, and sea, which is where we spend the vast preponderance of our money today on ships and aircraft and tanks and, and people, frankly, uh, is going to be diminished in terms of how important that is. That goes hand in hand with the idea that most of these forces that, that work in the air, land, and sea domain, the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, to a large extent, the Marine Corps, are forward deployed, and they're, they're set to defend the nation you know, hundreds or thousands of miles from our, our shore. They're, they're, they're built on a forward defense premise that we think is now going to be called into question. We're in an age where geography and threats are no longer directly connected to each other. We have our forces forward deployed to protect us from having to fight wars on our shores or to fight wars at home, but yet now we have threats that can leap over those forward defenses, much like the pandemic did, or much like a cyber attack could in the future, completely bypassing our biggest military investments and strike directly here at home. And that's gonna change how we think about defense the nation where we prioritize our defense. For defense with those you know, forces of iron and steel that I described them is gonna be less important than it's been in the past, even though that's where the majority of our investments are. We also think the reserve component is gonna come out of this with a very strong hand in terms of their utility. Uh, we describe them as a Swiss army knife, effectively a dual purpose force in the current crisis that has been incredibly useful to governors at the state level and been very adaptable in both uh, the reserve and the National Guard to meet some of these crises with expanding medical capabilities and generally being a high utility force that can be used both federally and most importantly at the state level in ways that the active duty component really doesn't fit particularly well. They're also incredibly cost effective relative to the active component. And the final big area we think the Pentagon is going to see some changes in, and this again is driven in a lot of ways by this intense budgetary pressure that we predict, is that we're going to see some significant cuts, not only in a lot of the legacy military programs that the military has been trying to modernize and where a huge amount of our procurement money goes into, you know, in, in you know, single seat fighter aircraft that are at the, the end of their technology curve on you know, large deck aircraft carriers and amphibians that are, again, at the top of their technology curve and are incredibly expensive. 
some of these big programs we can see being cut significantly, maybe some even terminated in the long term. And then also we think military end strength is going to go down. We think the, the one of the biggest bills the military has to pay year, year on year is how much it costs for people to be in active duty in uniform, you know, 365 days a year. And that, that those, you know, in times of defense constrictions on the budget, those are always areas where the military's got to get smaller. And again, one of the lessons that might come out of this pandemic is we can do an awful lot of things without having human beings doing that hands-on face-to-face every single day. And so I think we're, there's going to be a hard look at how we use that military manpower, how much it costs, and whether it's the most effective way to get the same kind of results if it's not a strictly military task. So those are four big areas uh, where we think that there's going to be some big changes inside of DOD. We've also written about that, that this may change the view and the prestige of the military and the American public. That's a somewhat different topic than what we're talking about today. But this is, in, in any, any way, again, I would I would go much further than General Hyten. This is going to be a transformative event, not only a world transformative event, but certainly one that's going to have a huge and very long enduring impact on the U.S. military and how it shapes itself for the road ahead. Thank you both for that. I, I think you said some interesting things there that I'd like to come back to at the end of our of our conversation if we have time. But but right now I'd like to kind of switch uh, switch perspectives here and talk about a little bit about how COVID-19 is impacting tactical training operations uh, and deployments right now. And and Brigadier General Sylvia, uh, you know, you're you're there in Poland right now uh, participating in such an exercise with the 1st Cavalry Division. I, I wonder how you might tell us, how did how did COVID-19 impact your, your initial training, uh, the mobilization, and then ultimately your deployment? Yeah, thanks, Brent. Um, and and uh, it's really, really an honor to be able to participate in, in this uh, in this forum here this evening. So so first off, just want to say uh, thanks for, for the opportunity to be here. Um, I am chiming in from uh, from Poznan, Poland, here in the uh, in, in the western portion of, of Poland. And and to answer your question, um, absolutely, kind of talk about uh, you know kind of where we started and how we ended up uh, down here. Uh, obviously, taking it down to a little more uh, granular tactical level than than some of the discussions uh, up to this point. Uh, but but really, so uh, uh, some of you may have heard of the Defender Europe uh, 20 uh, series. Uh, so it was a series of uh, six events that were supposed to take place over here in Europe in April and May. Uh, there were about 37,000 soldiers that were going to take place, uh, 10 different nations that were involved in this over here in Europe. Uh, and then, uh, and, and obviously, uh, things changed. Uh, the, the exercise was, uh, was postponed in some cases, canceled uh, in others. Uh, so uh, instead of having 20,000 soldiers and 20,000 pieces of equipment uh, come from the continental United States to participate in these six events, uh, um, about 90% of that equipment was loaded and, uh, and came over here. Uh, about 6,000 of those soldiers actually made it onto the, onto the European uh, continent. Uh, and, then, uh, and then obviously a lot of that uh, turned around and, and headed back to the States. Um, so, um, you know, from a strategic perspective, the strategic readiness of, of preparing forces and deploying forces, in many cases, those strategic objectives were met. Uh, but some of the tactical objectives of actually conducting the exercises and being able to participate and interoperate with our partners, uh, that, was a, that was an opportunity that we did not get. So uh, First Cavalry Division uh, has had uh, two, two uh, roles. The first was to come over here and participate in a couple of those exercises. And then the second was to be able to take over uh, a portion of the Operation Atlantic Resolve mission. Uh, so uh, about a month ago, uh, and, and actually I was supposed to fly over here on, uh, on March 16th, uh, which uh, if any of you uh, remember, that was the exact date that uh, we were told no one could move anymore. Uh, and so, uh, so as a result, um, you know, we kind of sat around and and uh, and and watched this thing unfold, and and went through, um, you know, our own uh, quarantines, our own stop moves, and and everything at at home station. Uh, and if you would have asked me a month ago uh, if I thought I was going to be in Poland right now, I would have said I, I didn't think so, uh, because uh, a month ago uh, we we weren't going to be moving. Uh, but then all of a sudden, you know, uh, the, the Department of Defense and the Army senior leaders um, said that, you know, this was important enough uh, for us to be able to, to start moving. And so, uh, so we've been over here now for, for three weeks uh, and we have recaptured some of the training events. And so the event that we are getting ready to start uh, 
is a, uh, a river crossing exercise with the Polish. It was originally supposed to be about nine or 10,000 soldiers uh, in Western Poland. It's, uh, it's down to about 6,000, so still, uh, still a pretty, uh, pretty uh, good size uh, that we'll be participating in. But there are some things to get to, to a portion of your question now, so what's different now? And, and really what we've done is we've taken a lot of our own lessons of being able to operate in a contaminated environment, a contaminated environment. Um, when you've got chemical or biological hazards that are out there, in this case, a, a biological one, what are the principles that we would like to employ? And really that's what we're doing right now. So we are going to be doing this large combined exercise, uh, 6,000 soldiers from two different nations uh, that'll be uh, coming from the United States, coming from Germany, come from Poland, all converging onto this one spot. And and how are we going to continue to protect the force? And and so we've uh, we we've established some some parameters on on how we operate. And and one of them is is to is to maintain some dispersion. Uh, we're going to segregate populations. Uh, which is uh, in some cases a little bit different than how we would normally operate. We would be a, a little bit more free flowing and in, in combining different organizations of different kinds and different types in, in order to be able to task organize them into combined arms teams. Uh, but we're going to keep them a little, little uh, less integrated uh, than they had been in the past in order to be able to keep you know, some protective bubbles, if you will, in order to be able to keep some of our populations uh, dispersed and segregated. At the individual level, obviously, we're, we're maintaining some dispersion, but when you think about it, uh, there is no social distancing inside of a tank. Uh, you got uh, four guys right on top of one another, and, uh, and they're, you know, they're, not, they're not maintaining a distance, and, uh, and, and you can't. But just like you know, when you go home, uh, you're not necessarily maintaining social distance from the people that you've been hanging out in your house with all day. Uh, so they become your family that you have segregated uh, from the from the remainder of the population, and we're maintaining as many of those safe bubbles uh, as we can out there. But in those cases where we have to break those, where we've got to be able to integrate with others, you know, we've got to exchange liaison officers, we've got to integrate staffs, we've got to conduct combined rehearsals. It's in those cases where we've instituted a pretty strict regimen of. Uh, if you can, we quarantine beforehand. Uh, in most cases, we're testing. Uh, so 100% of the U.S. soldiers that will participate in this exercise uh, will be tested uh, coming into the exercise. And then, and then once we're inside the exercise, you know, um, if uh, we will do surveillance testing on on certain populations, and if there's any obviously positives, we'll go through the whole uh, treatment and, and tracing. Um, our international counterparts. Uh, they uh, they don't necessarily have the same robust testing regimens, uh, but they have uh, made commitments to to do testing for those uh, liaison officers and those personnel that that leave their protective bubbles and operate you know inside of ours in order to be able to adhere to many of the of the same standards. So so we are going to train and and we are going to our warfight marriage. Just like General McConville, the, the Chief Staff of the Army, said, you, you, you can't compute or you can't uh, uh, tell us to combat. Uh, and so, so we've got to continue to not just protect our force, uh, but more importantly, make sure that we can you know, protect the nation. And, uh, and so that's, uh, that's what we're doing and, and taking all the appropriate precautions. Now, we're the first ones doing this at this scale in the Army right now. And so certainly there's uh, going to be a lot of lessons to be learned, and uh, we're going to be passing those lessons to the rest of the force because as the, as the rest of the force kind of unfolds through the course of the, the next month or two. So that's, uh, that's kind of how we're getting after it. Speaking of those lessons learned, what do you think is the, the one that stands out to you the most at this current time? Well, I... I'd have to tell you that it's uh, it's the resilience of our force. Uh, it is uh, it is the ability for us to to be able to to identify new conditions and figure out how we are going to innovate our our way through this. Um, I'll give you a, I'll give you one one example that uh, has been you know particularly inspiring is that you know we we've got all kinds of equipment um, and uh, and and it's about you know using these things uh, you know using perhaps old equipment in new ways. And uh, we had a young staff sergeant uh, who was here, part of a, of, of a, 
uh, chemical team uh, and he had some particular test equipment and uh, and started asking some questions you know hey if we use this for something else um, you know in the past can we use it you know for testing the coronavirus linked him up with some doctors from Monstrel who got linked up with some other people and eventually uh, pulled together uh, a team in order to be able to uh, quadruple the the testing uh, capacity uh, of the soldiers that we had that were already deployed over here in support of uh, the Defender exercises, uh, and so so we you know we've got a very resilient force. So we got you know we got a resilient families for sure, uh, but but being able to 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 take a blow uh, and figure out how are we gonna how are we gonna react, how are we gonna respond, how are we gonna innovate in order to be able to 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 get after you know the training objectives and and our readiness objectives that we needed to to sustain so uh so an old lesson relearned uh just about about really being uh, uh the resilient and and the the kind of human capital that we have in our military uh that uh, that really just makes things happen is uh, is is a lesson relearned i'd say General Sylvia, it certainly sounds like uh, you're definitely uh, doing doing some great work and and <laughs> really kind of being the, the the tip of the spear out there in terms of figuring out how the military is going to operate in a combat environment. So we you know we're certainly all proud of you and we want to thank you for your time. I don't know what time it is in Poland, but it's got to be pretty late. So I, I really certainly appreciate you taking time out of your day. Uh, we have some questions in here, so if you can. Uh, hang on, we'd appreciate it, but if you have to go, we certainly understand. Uh, this, well, this is the, the next time, but uh, but more than willing to take uh, take questions. All right, thank you, General. Uh, Andy, I want to switch to to the the installation side, and what uh -huh. how day to day life has changed uh, for service members and military families as they you know head to work and then head back outside the gates to go home and go to school or, or school from home. Can, can you talk a little bit about how installation operations have had to shift and adapt during these past few months? Uh, sure. I, uh, I, can, I can try to cover a few, few examples. Um, so obviously one of the ones that's been talked about a lot is the interruption of PCS moves, uh, which of course creates a, uh, you know, a significant series of downstream ripple effects, right? So that there will be units you know where where folks were supposed to report at a certain time, and every time you know these different units or organizations have a PCS, you know these, there are procedures in place to do kind of a warm handoff, and, and so all, all of that kind of has been you know pushed right. And so some some folks are trying to operate with with some holes in their organization. So there's sort of it's just sort of a personnel type of churn that's happening. Uh, another example that's you know some specific examples. Uh, for example, I know Fort Jackson uh, did, a, I believe, a two-week pause of basic training because of, um, uh, you know, the, the in incredible close uh, proximity that uh, basic trainees uh, are, you know, are encountering. And as the previous uh, general mentioned, you know, there's not, uh, you know, there's a, there's a limit to how much social distancing you can truly do uh, when when you have, the, uh, you know, recruits uh, in close proximity to each other. So they're doing what they can, but they're doing a lot of monitoring where the recruits are coming from. They're doing, you know, things like temperature checks, uh, you know, they'll, they'll do more screening uh, with testing and such. Uh, I see, you know, so to, to try to, you know, if, the, if a, if a, uh, if a hotspot occurs, they're trying to prevent that hotspot from, from, you know, ex uh, exploding throughout the rest of the different uh, trainee uh, units, you know, cadres. Um, uh, the, uh, the other thing that's that's happened, particularly for family members and such, is that a lot of installations have imposed travel restrictions uh, within a certain radius. Uh, so, for example, at Fort Leonard Wood, my understanding is that they didn't want, um, you know, I think it was like 50 miles. Uh, they wanted to keep soldiers uh, and family members essentially out of St. Louis, knowing that, uh, you know, there's going to be a higher likelihood in the denser populated areas uh, for, uh, you know, infection rates to be higher in those places. Uh, I also know that. Uh, Lots of different installations have put uh, different certain types of business establishments off limits. Uh, I've been following, uh, I, I think there'll be some significant lessons learned too. I've been following at some, some level of interest some of the, some of the roles that, uh, that uh, the, our forces in, in uh, Vicenza, you know, in, in Italy, as well as in South Korea, uh, given that those two installations, you know, in terms of um, 
Camp Humphreys and, uh, you know, some of our folks in Seoul. Uh, so there, there, you know, I'll be very curious to see, you know, the differences and similarities between how, uh, the restrictions and the procedures that we've uh, followed in those foreign installations compare with what we did, uh, and are doing inside the United States. Um, so I know that, uh, you know, uh, generally, of course, we try to follow the host nation guidelines. Um, but, uh, there's certainly, um, a lot of uh, schools. I mean, that's the other thing I want to touch upon, you know, so school, a lot, most uh, places have, uh, have suspended school. I, I believe most of them have suspended it for the rest of the year. Um, and that has, pr that has pr presented, uh, a lot of challenges. I mean, I could personally speak to that <laughs> uh, with two uh, school-aged kids. Um, and so that's going to affect, in many cases, how uh, the ability to sort of return to normal, too, because, uh, you know, we now have an external situation that we normally don't account for, right? We normally account for the fact that uh, child care arrangements, you know, do usually don't require, you know, sort of summer schedules, you know, for the entirety of potentially of a year uh, or for a, for a long period of time. So, uh, I think, you know, the, there's an interrelationship between, uh, the, uh, schooling policies, uh, and, and ha what flexibility, uh, family members will have in terms of their ability to do work and simultaneously be responsible for, uh, you know, so, uh, particularly if schools have to go into a more intensive distance learning situation, uh, which, which I know, and of course I can speak mainly to Fairfax County, Virginia, where I, where I'm living. Uh, but that, that will present a lot of challenges, uh, you know, if, if, if I have to spend time or my wife has to spend time, you know, doing, you know, lessons online, w which are being counted, right? In Fairfax County, you know, right now, the, the, th the fourth quarter grades are not really being counted. They're just, you're just sort of getting your average of the third quarter, uh, repeated for the fourth effectively. But that, that'll change a lot of things if, if the schooling changes, uh, last, uh, you know, for months or even in the next year. What about even when it comes to training exercises on post? Can you talk about training ranges or even going to the formation or PX or are they, is that kind of by installation, uh, how they set those policies or is there a guidance at least across the Army uh, for how those operations are conducted in this new environment? Well, uh, we, the Secretary Esper just sent out some guidance uh, on uh, changing the health protection condition, the HPCon statuses, um, and uh, I, I, you know, I just got a copy of of the memo, uh, and I was trying to crash on it uh, right before this call, so I'm still kind of digesting uh, some of its implications. But I would say um, they they did leave a lot of latitude to the installation. For example, you know, uh, whether or not barber shops remain open or are closed, that that seemed to vary quite a bit uh, from what I could observe across the army. Uh, you know, they clearly changed, uh, a lot of the, you know, in terms of the, the, the different categories of folks that could use the, the, the commissaries, right? That got, that got tweaked in a lot of installations. So I think, I think there'll probably be more standardization, uh, of, of these policies, uh, as we go into the, into the relaxation, you know, as, as we, as we move into sort of, you know, phased return to normal. Uh, I, you know, for w one thing that, you know, again, this was covered in the press, so I'm not like revealing anything confidential here. But I, I did notice that in the in the memo from Dr. Esper to, to the installations um, that uh, that there's flexibility to be more stringent. But he, the, the the memo makes it clear that if you're going to be less stringent, uh, you know, more relaxed than uh, than the local community, then you, there, there's you know kind of a a test that you have to go higher up your chain of command. So I thought that was kind of you know, and so so it, so the bias is in favor of more restriction, not less. Over. Thanks, Andy. I appreciate that. Now, this this next question is for everyone. And I, are there any silver linings in terms of this pandemic uh, proving a forcing function uh, for needed changes or advances in practices or technology applications um, that have been struggling for some time for one reason or another? Um, are there some positives that have come out of this? And and maybe uh, G General Barno, I'd like your opinion on that. Yeah, I think there are, and maybe in two ways. One is that I think it's really driving home uh, how much we can do online. This webinar is a perfect example of this. You know, we would not be doing these kind of functions with this kind of an audience 
and and I've seen this in in both teaching and in a variety of other uh, online interactions that Dr. Bensell and I have done in the last three months that we probably would never have done in person because it would have been too difficult to do that. And so we're finding that this venue is actually a very effective way to communicate and to network and to pass information. We're finding we're all of us now working from home, which we really didn't think we could do before, and that's going to change how society works, I think, in the future. And you know, alter you know commutes and alter the value of being in the office five days a week after a one-hour commute in every direction if you live in Washington D.C. So I think that's going to cause some major realignments in terms of how we think about work and how we actually either work remotely or have to go face to face in dense urban areas, especially. I think that'll be a difference. On the military side, I think there's going to be, uh, you know, General Heighton alluded to some of these these changes that they're going to come out of this is how how we use technology differently. And we're going to be driven in some ways because of much tighter budgets, I think we believe to probably not be as profligate in the use of military manpower as we've been in the past. You know, if you're in the military, you know, there's a kind of a aphorism that says that that manpower is free. If you walk around the Pentagon and look at the size of the staffs and look at the size of the outer offices, you don't see that when you go to any corporate headquarters in America because we have so many people doing all of these tasks and there's no capital cost to that that's felt by the by the organization. So I think we're going to look at ways to actually use some of this technology now to be able to replace people doing a number of the tasks that, that the DOD is far greater than any other organization I can think of been able to throw manpower at tasks that everyone else does in a lot of ways using technology. So I think there, there's a positive there as well. Let me maybe follow that with uh, two additional comments. Uh, the first follows up on something that General Sylvia said. Uh, you use the word resilience of uh, talking about your, your soldiers and how they're reacting. Um, I'd use the word adaptability, and, and part of the reason for that is because General Barno and I are publishing a book on September 1st called Adaptation Under Fire, which talks about the importance of military adaptability because you don't know what types of environments you're going to be operating in. Uh, the need to adapt is, is uh, more important than ever, and I think uh, you know, you're seeing great demonstrations of that with your soldiers and I think a lot of folks in the U.S. military. Uh, this is a, a good example of a sort of outside shock that no one saw coming that people have had to react to uh, very creatively and, and coming up with new ideas under some extraordinary pressure. Uh, and I think, you know, especially at the junior levels, as always, the U.S. military does that really well. At the senior level, sometimes it's harder, but uh, uh, those on the front lines uh, often do that extremely well. I think at the broader level, there is an opportunity here, but it's coming from a negative place, and that is the degree of budget cuts that we think are coming. Um, you know, even in the era of sequestration, those budget cuts were very difficult for the Department of Defense, but largely uh, the department was able to avoid making some very fundamental trade-offs between current legacy systems, for example, and next generation technologies. They weren't forced into a choice uh, because resources were still enough to support that. The degree of budget cuts that may be coming because of the overwhelming economic effect uh, of the pandemic on the country may force those decisions to, you know, to be made in an even tougher way than they were over the past several years. And although that's not a situation anyone wants to be in, that could lead to an opportunity to invest in some new technologies, next generation types of things that end up making the force more adaptable, more capable of warfare in the 21st century and has some positive follow-on effects, again, even if that's not the way people uh, would want to get to that point. Thank you both. Yeah, Matt. I appreciate oh. that. Please, go ahead. Oh, yeah. So, so I, I wanted to, 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 to pile on a little bit on what uh, a theme that uh, General Borno had mentioned. Um, you know, I, I was talking with uh, a, co a colleague uh, in the real estate world, um, uh, to picking his brain on what he's seeing and hearing on uh, how, how this is likely to affect, you know, real estate uh, commercially. And I, and I think it has a lot of applicability uh, to DOD, too. Uh, so, so number one, I think one silver lining for us is there's a, you know, given the, the, the forced experiment with telecommuting, uh, I, I don't think we can avoid the need to rethink our facility design standards and, and requirements so that we can account for telecommuting. In other words, we, prior to COVID, we've been using telecommuting and VTC and such, uh, but we have never really, we've still operated in sort of 20th century way 
where each or person in the organization gets a, a permanently assigned workstation, right? And and private industry has moved away from that type of practice for at least 10 years, uh, and we've resisted that. Um, and although there, they'll, we won't probably be able to go to a full WeWork style, you know, ultra dense uh, work work site uh, solution set, because I think that won't work either in a COVID world. Um, but but those are extremes, right? And we're unfortunately on the one end of the extreme. We've got a lot of place space uh, to to move closer to a WeWork type of environment uh, than than others, for example, who've already committed, you know, wholeheartedly to it. Um, so there, I think there's opportunities to save money there. Um, there's opportunities to to make uh, our facilities more flexible. And for example, like you know, we we tend to to be very functionally specific when we design our facilities. There's you know each space is used and intended to be used essentially for one primary task for one tenant. Uh, you know, again, private industry has not generally done that. Uh, I you know, given that we'll have to use our facilities differently than what they were designed for. For some period of time until a vaccine is widely available, so I think there'll be a lot of change that we'll see, uh, hopefully positive, uh, in terms of building more flexible, cheaper, operate real you know facilities. Um, the other thing I think there's a huge opportunity for is uh, the use of geolocation data. Uh, which is, these are sort of the cell phone uh, enabled uh, or smart device enabled um, GPS coordinates that are periodically sent up. Uh, with the, the app information, um, sometimes enabled continuously, sometimes enabled when uh, the user is using that particular app. And there, there's a huge commercial uh, industry that's analyzing this geolocation data and, and doing, you know, a lot of sort of smart city type uh, opportunities, which, we, again, we have not really embraced that. Uh, and, and geolocation is being used uh, quite significantly in terms of contact tracing and other things. Uh, related to COVID, in, try, in terms of understanding, you know, what these these travel restrictions and social distancing measures, a lot of countries and a lot of healthcare providers and epidemiologists are using that to get a sense of in real time, you know, how effective are you know these different restrictions. You know, for example, if we if we say that you shouldn't have more than some number of people, you know, in a park, right? With geolocation data, if you have the parameters set correctly, you can at a glance tell. You know what's the average density uh, of usage of that space? You know, and and you can very quickly determine that. And while it's like triple what we thought it should be, you could start to tweak your your guidance rather than waiting for the cases to start piling up uh, to to rethink that, and then have to go through a bunch of manpower intensive contact tracing interviews uh, to try to figure out oh it was the park that was causing all the problem. You know, so I think there's a lot of opportunities with geolocation data to get things as as varied as uh, uh, you know, sort of automated traffic studies, uh, like I said, you know, contact tracing. Uh, we could use it to do, uh, you know, automated censuses of buildings to get a sense of, you know, how many people really are using these spaces. And it, and it, and it links back to how do you shrink your real estate portfolio to get after some of those savings, uh, you know, given those uh, budgetary pressures that Dr. Benchanel had mentioned. Over. Thanks, Andy. I'm glad you brought that up. You and I had an interesting discussion about that the other day. Um, General Sylvia, I'd like to pass that same question over to you and, and final comments uh, over there from Poland. Yeah, thanks. Uh, you know, from the uh, you know, opportunities perspective, uh, I, I tell you, you know, uh, certainly one of them is um, maybe maybe uh, not necessarily a great one, but when there are tougher times in the economy. Um, there are uh, more people that kind of uh, head to the recruiter, and uh, and and at a time when we're trying to fill out some of the tougher uh, you know skills, you know the the ones that uh, that General Barno talked about, you know cyber and space and you know building out some of those capabilities. I think it's going to be a much more attractive uh, option uh, for some of those with uh, with some niche skills that that may not have considered the military uh now consider it a, as a you know as a viable option um, so so that's certainly one and one uh, kind of at a at a small uh, tactical level and for those that uh, uh have been in the army can probably appreciate this um nobody ever really takes the uh the chemical training seriously and uh and so when you head out to the fields you know nobody wants to put on that you know that big uh you know mop suit and the gloves and the booties and you know go through all that kind of stuff well people are taking it serious now and uh 
you know, people are people are wearing those gloves and they're wearing their protective gear and, and they're paying attention uh, to these things. Uh, so uh, so certainly that's a you know, that's a it's a it's a it's a booming industry for our chemical officers uh, beyond just, uh, you know, do, doing USR. So uh, so so that's uh, so that's great. And, uh, and and certainly a, an opportunity uh, for for them out there. And you know I've, I've been in the army now almost uh, 26 years, and and uh, been through lean budget years and and not. And uh, certainly when we go through the leaner times, we you know we we innovate more, and and there are opportunities that exist there uh, as well. Uh, so uh, so yeah. So thanks thanks uh, thanks for asking the question. Well, as a former uh, Seaburn Army NCO. I, I, I can finally say, ah, see, I made you go through that training for a reason. Um, well, thank you all. This is, has been great. I really appreciate uh, all of you taking time today. I think it was a, a very interesting discussion, and it's going to be interesting to see how this, this all plays out and impacts uh, our military. And I think hopefully it will make us stronger and more resilient, like several of you have said. Um, but we've run out of time. I apologize. We don't, uh, we can't get to the audience questions, but uh, we will try and do our best to, to see if we can find answers for those and put them up on our website. So please check there. Uh, I also want to remind everyone attending today to please check your email following this town hall. You will all be receiving follow-up information regarding this discussion, as well as some important links. One of those links is for our new Resilience Under Stress study. This study is fielding responses from May 13 to June 10 to capture, examine, and compare how the universal stressors of COVID-19 have impacted military and veteran families. This study is being conducted by our CMSI initiative in collaboration with the Institute for Veteran and Military Families at Syracuse University. Uh, as a reminder, a link to the post-webinar survey and pain points poll will also be in that email. A lot of links, a lot of surveys, but we appreciate uh, your time and feedback, and it truly helps us make sure that we're uh, hitting all of the topics and providing you with the resources that you need. And finally, I want to invite everyone to join us on Tuesday, May 26th at 3 p.m. for a town hall that will focus on how news reporters across the country are following COVID-19 and really on the ground stories uh, from it, the challenges military families are are facing and then overcoming and how they're working with communities and and uh, and service members uh, across the country. Uh, in the meantime, be, to be sure to check out our website, which is full of resources to help you, your family, and your business during this difficult time. Thank you again for joining us today, and we look forward to welcoming you at a future webinar. Thanks all, have a good Memorial Day weekend.